Okay, hi, uh, this is Job Aguas, and welcome to my lectures in ethics and moral philosophy. This is now, this is the first lecture, lecture one, introduction, man as a moral agent. Now you may wonder, uh, what's the connection between ethics and man? Well, first of all, um, man is the one who performs the action or the act which we can consider to be moral or immoral or ethical or not ethical so in this lecture we will focus first on man as a moral agent or man as an ethical agent so what do we mean by man being a moral agent First, we have to understand that man is a rational and free agent. Because you're going to ask, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by man being rational and free? As human, being, human beings, we are all endowed with rationality. We can think, we can reason, we can analyze, we can evaluate. So we have this capacity to reason. And because of our reason, we can deliberate and make conscious decisions. We can weigh, we can make options. We can, for example, when we wake up in the morning, we can say, well, we can ask, what am, I, what am I going to do today? Am I going to attend the lecture? Am I going to attend the, I mean, the, or just play or sit the whole day, do nothing? So. We can deliberate. We can consider several options and make our decisions because of our capacity to think. But we are not just endowed with rationality. We are also endowed with free will. And because of this free will, we can determine the course of our action and what will be the goal of our action. So we can make decisions at the same time, that decision will always be free. Well, of course, some people may advise us. Some people may say, uh, we give us counsel. But it will be us who will determine what will be the course of our action. So you see, we are rational. We are capable of deliberating. At the same time, we are free to do what we want to do. Okay? So, that's being rational and free. Now, since we are rational and free agents, since we are the ones who think about what we are going to do, and since we are the ones who decide, you know, we are free to make decisions, then we are automatically responsible for our actions, okay? For the things that we do. So for example, if you decide that you're not going to attend this lecture, for example, and you decide to do something else, then you will have to face certain consequences or there will be consequences of your action, okay? So every time we make a decision, Everything, every time that we we do something out of our own rational capacity and freedom, then we become responsible for them. And our responsibility is not only for our actions, but also for the consequences. And for the quality of the choice that we make, of course. Right? So if you decide, for example, to say... Uh, uh, skip class, then you have to have, you have to uh, be responsible for that. If you decide, for example, to uh, go out of quarantine, then you have to be responsible for that. Go out of the house despite all the prohibitions, then you have to be responsible for the consequences of your action. And the more that we are, we, the more that we have the capacity to reason, and the more that we are free the greater the responsibility. Remember what Peter Parker said in uh, the Spider-Man. 
with great power and rationality is a power comes great responsibility so the extent of our knowledge and freedom determines the extent of our rational or our responsibility therefore the greater the freedom the greater the knowledge the greater is the responsibility you know sometimes today people are always talking about freedom 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 the freedom to express the freedom to do this the freedom to speak the freedom to, to profess etc etc but there's one thing that they are forgetting they're forgetting that their freedom has a twin brother or twin sister and that twin is responsibility so we should not forget responsibility if you think of freedom automatically you have to think also of your responsibility okay so because of our freedom and responsibility we are always concerned with what is right and what is wrong okay because everything that we do whether right or wrong there is always a consequence okay and we always have to think of the consequences of the things that we do whether right or wrong so we contemplate on what is the right thing to do and what is the bad thing to avoid okay so Studying is the right thing to do. Going out, despite all the prohibitions, is bad thing to do. Unless you have you have something to do outside, very essential, then you can do. But of course, when you make the decision that you're going out, you have to be responsible, right? So, the more mature that we that we become, the greater our responsibility. Because when we mature, of course, we gain more knowledge and we gain more freedom. So, the end of all this, this concern for doing the right thing and avoiding the, the bad things, is our desire to live a well-lived life. As human beings, we don't just want to live our lives. We want to live it well. We don't just want to, you know, I'm living, but of course you want to have a good life. Live your life. Well, as the saying goes, a well-lived life is a happy life. So the end of all this is you want to be happy. You want to have a good life, a well-lived life. It's not just good having all the comforts in life. A well-lived life is a life that is meaningful. Okay, a life that is, you know, uh, done for the good things. Right? So you are studying right now, despite, of course, uh, the difficulties, because, of course, you want to have a good life in the future. It's not just a life with all the, you know, when you become a doctor or when you become a, uh, uh, a lawyer or an accountant or a businessman or an engineer or a nurse or a policeman. Uh, there is always the desire to have a meaningful, a well-lived life because our desire really is to be happy in our life. Well, some people may equate happiness with with money, with wealth, with power, but I doubt if with plenty of money you're going to have a well-lived life. Right? That's a different. That's a different thing. So happiness and living well is related to the good. And those that we value in life and so you want to be happy and you want to have a meaningful and well-lived life you always connect that with the things that you consider to be good and valuable but what do you mean by good and value what is what is good and what is value okay so we focus on that the good and value well when you say good well, there are many different interpretations of good, but the good is objectively the goal or fulfillment of being man. See, the, the, the goal or fulfillment of being man. Of course, that's why you always connect good with happy, because if you attain what is good, you become happy. It's the object of our desire, right? It is the object of our will. The object of our faculty of volition will is our the faculty of our volition right aside from i already mentioned one of our 
capacities, one of our faculties, and that is reason, right? The object of reason is to search the truth, but the object of the will is to search for what is the good, okay? So, the good is the object of the will, or as the object of the will, is considered to be the driving force of human action and human endeavors. It is what really motivates us, the good, okay? So the will, our will, when it recognizes the good, it becomes motivated. So the good is the one that drives the will to act. It is the one that drives us to do certain things because it's the good thing. Of course, the opposite of good is evil, and evil is the one that, you know, that we want to avoid. So. Uh, you see something good, you move towards it, okay? But you see something evil, you, you stay away from it, right? So the good is the one that really drives, really motivates us into doing something, into acting, okay? So the good could either be real and objective good or just an apparent good. What do you mean by real objective? It is something that is really good in itself. Like, for example, health, knowledge, these are objectively good. Whether, whether you consider it to be good, it is always good in itself, right? They are, good, they are objectively good. That's the meaning of real and objective good. It is good in itself. It does not depend on the, you know, on what other people think about knowledge. What, what people may not like to gain knowledge, but knowledge will always be good. Now, some things or objects which we consider to be good are only apparent. What do you mean by apparent? They appear to be good, but in reality, they are not. Right? It is only our subjective valuations, subjective feelings that make them good. They appear to be good, but in reality, they are not. For example, vices. Right? Smoking, for example, may appear to be good, but would you consider smoking as objectively good? Like health, for example. Okay, So it may appear to be good on some people. Drugs, for example, it may appeal to other people like good, but objectively drugs, I mean illegal drugs, they are in reality evil. Objective and apparent. Now, let's go to the next value. Because we always tend to associate good with value. Okay? Value is an assessment of worth. In, in Filipino, it's halaga. Good, mabuti, kabutihan, mabuti. Value is halaga, the assessment of worth. And it is what an individual or a group of people deems to be useful, to be significant, to be desirable. All right? Your parents is valuable to you. They are significant. They are meaningful. They are close to you. Food is valuable because it has, well, it has a use, it has a purpose, it is desirable. Friends, valuable. Money, of course, valuable because it has worth. Career, knowledge, what else? Education, they have value. So when you say value, it is our assessment of the worth of something could be people, it could be object, it could be occasion, it could be ideas, it could be anything that we consider to be valuable. Okay, so value constitutes a large part of who we are and how we live. Because these things that we value, like people, like objects, places, events, situations, occasions, they define who we are. The things that we value 
define who we are. And it also defines how we live. So if you value money, then your life, you will live your life according to how you value money. You will prefer money above all things. If you value your family, then you will live your life according to you cannot live without your family, right? Because it's it's the one that you value most, or friends, or love, whatever. So it constitutes a large part of who we are and how we conduct our lives, how we behave, everything. See? So if you value your studies, it will define who you are, it will define your priorities, it will define everything. If you value God, then it will define everything. It will affect your life. Okay? So, think of the value that way. So, value could either be objective or subjective. Okay? What do you mean by objective and subjective value? An objective value is something that is independent of our assessment. So, the worth, the value of something does not depend on the valuation or estimation of individuals or group of individuals. It does not depend whether that value is recognized by people. When you say it is an objective value, it has a value in itself, intrinsic value. All right? So I consider, for example, health. Well, some people may not care for their health, or at least now because of the COVID-19 disease, people now are valuing their health. But do you think health does not have any value at all before people started, you know, considering their health to be valuable? No. Health has always been valuable, regardless whether people value health or not. Now, what about the human person? Well, the human person is valuable. See? Well, some people, the poor especially, may, well, they are always the victim of killings, etc., etc. But they, because they are people, they are human persons, they have objective value, intrinsic value. And we don't lose our value as a person, even if people don't recognize the value of our humanity. Okay? The human person is always valuable because its value is intrinsic. It's objective. Right? And you know what is the basis of the intrinsic value of human beings, of the human person? Well, because we were created in the image and likeness of God. We are imago Dei. So the value of an objective good is independent of the recognition or appreciation of man. So like, for example, I already mentioned good health, knowledge, they have objective values. Human persons have objective values. Now, what about the subjective values? These are those that are conferred by individuals on certain objects or situations. Meaning, it's people, it's us, who make it valuable. So when you say subjective value, it's not a value in itself. It is a value that is conferred by us to certain things or to certain situations. And therefore, something may be valuable to me because I confer value to it. But it may not be valuable to other people. So the subjective value is dependent on the estimation or evaluation of individuals. So that something may be valuable to one, but not valuable to others. I value my friends. My friends may not be valuable to other people. Right? I'll, I value, for example, an old picture of my father or an old picture of our family. And it, it's really close to my heart. 
But when you show it to other people, they may not find any value in it because, well, it's already faded. They don't know who is in the picture, etc., etc. So it's a subjective value. Right? So when we become sentimental about something, we're actually conferring certain values, certain things. Now, there are things that we don't want to, to throw away because they have sentimental values. But these sentimental values are subjective values because they are values that are conferred by us to certain things. You know, during this pandemic, people have a lot of time to clean up their, you know, the house and old, you know, old things. They discover old things and then some people would say, well, just throw them away because it's already old. It's already damaged. But people don't throw, don't just throw certain things, certain objects, because for them, they are valuable, subjective values. Even your work, you confer value to your own work, huh? to your own paintings, to your, you know, your compositions, etc., etc., because they have values to you, subjective value. Okay? Now, Next point is that values have certain ranking or hierarchy, meaning there's always a, a uh, sort of a steps, no? a hierarchy, ranking of values. So some values are higher or more significant than others, and some values have higher worth than others. So there is an objective values, an objective ranking of values. And this ranking is not dependent on our preferences. For example, uh, of course, subjectively, you may value this, uh, this laptop over some other things because the laptop is valuable to you. No, uh, there is an objective ranking of values independent of our preferences or, you know, subjective. So, for example, material values are necessarily lower in rank as compared to the spiritual values. Right. That's why if you're going to ask a lot of people, if they're going to be objective about the whole thing, uh, if you ask them, what is more valuable to you, your wealth or your family? Of course, this, the family would be more important than, than money. They're going to say, well, because you know, if you lose money, you can just recover the money, but the family is, should always be there. Right? If you're going to compare the value of the spiritual, like God, for example, and material possessions, obviously, God is more valuable than material possessions. So there is this objective ranking or hierarchy of values. But of course, it's also possible that personally, subjectively, we have our own ranking of values. Right? So what will be... If, you go, if I'm going to ask you what is the most valuable to you, if you're going to rank these four, for example, you have money, you have your pride, you have your friends, you have your family. So, family, friends, uh, money pride so you're going to rank it according to your own subjective ranking of values but objectively uh, family and friends will always be higher in value than money or pride right so the value of persons is higher than the value of money the value of education and knowledge is higher and the value of physical properties. Of course, as I've said, subjectively, people may re rearrange this depending on the things that they value more. So the more spiritual the value, the higher it is in the ranking of values. And the more material the value is, the lower it is in the ranking of values. Okay? So we have to, uh, you, you know, our value system, our ranking of values, they serve as basis of our priority because you will always, things that are of higher value will always take priority over things. See? 
So if you value, for example, uh, material possessions, then it will be the highest for you. But there should always be an objective ranking of values. So only man can formulate and express values, which are generally shaped and formed by his experiences. I'll give you one example. In your family, if you have very nice experiences in your family, you will value more your experiences in the family. And your family and your experiences with your family really shape who you are. See? So, values are inseparable from the endlessly changing experiences of man's life. The value may be material, of course. So you, have, you can consider value as material value of the physical things. There is societal value, the value that we have in the society, aesthetic value, religious value, and moral value. So there are many different types, types of values. And these types are still ranked according to some objective, you know, uh, objective basis. So when we talk of values in the realm of human conduct, we call them moral values. So justice, honesty, love, generosity, compassion, you know, uh, respect, these are all moral values. Okay? Of course, that's different from the value of money, okay? the value of wealth, right? This, because they are physical values. But in, this, in ethics, we are more concerned with the moral values. Now, let's part in this uh, first lecture, Role of Human Experience. Uh, philosophers talk about experience, okay, experience. And they talk about two kinds of experience. The first is sense experience. When you talk of sense experience, that's the experience of our senses, all right? Sense of sight hearing, taste, uh, sound, touch, these are sensible experiences. So if you can see something, then you experience it visually. If you can taste something, then you experience it by tasting. If you can hear something, then there is audio experience, okay? But there's another kind of experience that philosophers are talking about. And this is what they call live experience. Live experience. I give you one example. If you, if there are two people, two persons enter a church, say the first one is, let us say, a tourist, right? And the other one enters the church as a church goer, as well as a. Uh, as a parishioner, for example, somebody who will, you know, pray. So when the tourist enters the church, since he's, he enters as a tourist, he will focus his, you know, his attention on probably the altar, the paintings, and he's going to have a visual experience. All right. And that visual experience would be a sensible experience through the senses. But consider the religious person, the parishioner who goes to the church to pray. What will he experience there? He will experience there the divine. He will experience there the presence of God. So you see two people entering a church, the same, the same place, but they have two different experiences. The other one is a sensible experience based on the senses. The other one is a personal experience, a lived experience. Okay. Now, if you compare the two, anybody can have a visual experience of the altar, the painting, etc., etc. But Consider two parishioners. They're going to have different live experience. Okay? 
because they're going to have the, the, the experience, the religious experience, the personal life experience is unique from one person to another person. My experience of the divine will be different from the experience of other people. Okay, So it's a personal experience. A live experience is a personal experience. Okay, Now, how do we connect that to action? Live experience is the awareness on our part that when we perform a certain action, we are the author, the agent of that of that act because it's a personal experience because of this personal live experience we realize that i am the agent the author of the action so it allows us to focus not on the external object like for example in a in a in a sense experience we focus on the object right we focus on the painting we focus on the beautiful sunset, for example. But in a living space, we focus on our self. This, the self as the agent of the act, as the one who experiences. So this awareness or experience of being the agent makes us aware of our responsibility for the value of human action. A while ago, I, talk, I was talking about that we have to be responsible, right, for our action. But what allows us to connect the act to us? What allows us to say we are responsible for the action? Our realization that we are the ones who did the act because of our experience. I will just would like to connect this to, for example, uh, uh, in, in psychology, I remember Jean Piaget talks about uh, uh, in one of the stages of the of his cognitive, you know, uh, stages of cognitive development. There is a point, there is a stage where the child recognizes or realizes that he's the agent of his action. That, for example, when he drops his toy, he becomes, you know, he soon realizes, okay, I cannot point to anybody. I cannot, you know, I cannot uh, say it's you who did it. Because the baby or the child realizes that it was him or her who dropped the toy. If he spilled or she spilled, his or her milk, he cannot blame other people because he or she realizes that it was him or her who caused his milk to spill. That's the role of experience. It makes us realize our responsibility for the action that we do. So since one experiences himself in his person as the agent or the cause of the act, then he also experiences himself as the efficient cause of the moral good or evil associated with the action. He cannot blame. He, he becomes, you know, uh, he's the cause of the. So if you do something good, you do something good. Automatically, I did it. So you become happy, right? You own because you did something good so if you did something good and somebody your teacher praises you then it was uh, it's me right because you are the efficient cause of the reaction now suppose you do something evil what do you do but people who do bad things they hide they you know escape why because they realize that they are the ones who did the evil action simple right you do good act you own it you are proud of it because it's you who did it you committed murder 
you committed corruption? You deny it. Why do you deny it? Because you will be responsible for your action. And why are you responsible for your action? Because it's you who did it. So human experience is very important in ethics. Because it is that which allows us to recognize that we are the ones responsible for our action. Right? So that ends the first lecture. And thank you very much for listening.